Thank you, musicians, for leading us in worship. Well, brothers, go ahead and uh, grab your Bibles again and turn to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 7. And as you're turning there, one of the brothers asked me in the break, I think I forgot to mention, he said, Eric, what were you complaining about up in the, when you were hunting in the fall? I didn't harvest a bull. That's what I was complaining about, to my shame. And that's happened more than once, by the way, brothers, I have to confess. But the Lord's grace is abundant. The cross is ever there before us to remind us that Christ has bled for our sins. But as we conclude our, our time of study here, and I thought about what we would give our attention to sort of back up a little bit, big picture. And as we've thrown anchor in God and his attributes and his majesty and looked at the, the glory and the greatness of the one and the true, the only God, the God of the Bible, I think a one fitting conclusion to that is to give attention to our own holiness. And to realize that in light of who God is and what he's done for us and the wrath-bearing sacrifice of our blessed Savior and his resurrection, God being set apart, that word holy means different, distinct, the set-apartness of God. He, he calls us and commands us, not in our own strength, not to save ourselves. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone, not works. We are not saved through holiness. We're saved through the Holy One, Jesus Christ. But as a result of that, if you were one way, if you were to capture, so God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to, how do you want me to live? And the, in, the, in the answer to that that the scriptures give is holiness. First Peter 1, look there if you would. And we'll uh, apologize. I told you to go to Joshua 7. We'll get back there in a minute. But go to 1 Peter 1. Uh, I mentioned it briefly last night. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. As Peter is speaking to a suffering people being persecuted by the Roman Empire at the time, facing great consequence for their faith in Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, he tells them, big picture to equip them in the face of, of a hostile world that's going to hassle them, Verse 13, he says, Therefore, having girded your minds for action, thinking the right thing, thinking about God the way that God thinks about God, thinking about the scriptures and life the way God does, girding our minds for action, being sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not being conformed to the former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you. Be holy yourselves also in all your conduct because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And I just want to emphasize at the outset of this, brothers, that our call to holiness is because of and in light of the cross and the resurrection of Christ. We do not be holy to save ourselves. I, I had a gentleman one time come to me and from what I could, from what I knew of his life, uh, was not a regenerate man, was not a saved man, had not put his trust alone in Jesus Christ for right standing with God. And he was talking to me about uh, a book he was reading and that was going back to the Old Testament commands of how to be holy. And you will never do that. We can never, ever do that. The purpose of the commands, Romans 3.20 tells us, is to show us that we are never going to arrive at holiness apart from the grace of God. So back to Joshua chapter 7. As we think about our call as men, as single men, as dads, as husbands, what is the great need of a man? I think we can safely say that the great need of a man is to be holy. To walk in holiness. That catch-all term to be set apart in the world but not of the world. 
as it's been said, to have your boat in the water, but no water in the boat. In this text, we'll see a tragic situation where a man compromised that, and I trust the Lord will help us pull some lessons out of that. Follow along as I read Joshua chapter 7. The inspired, inerrant, authoritative, and sufficient word of God reads Joshua 7 verse 1. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things devoted to destruction. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. Therefore, the anger of Yahweh burned against the sons of Israel. Now Joshua set, sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. Then they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need go up to strike down Ai. Do not have all the people toil up there, for there are few. So about 3,000 men from the people went up there, but they fled from the men of Ai, and the men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shabarim and struck them down on the descent so that the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of Yahweh until evening. Both he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Joshua said, Alas, O Lord Yahweh, why did you ever bring Bring this people over the Jordan only to give us into the hand of the Amorites to make us perish? If only we had been willing to live beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their back before their enemies and the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and they'll surround us and cut off our name from the earth and what will you do? What will you do for your great name? So Yahweh said to Joshua, rise up. Why is it that you've fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. And they've also trespassed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they've even taken some of the things devoted to destruction and have both stolen and dealt falsely. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Therefore, the sins of Israel cannot rise before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become devoted to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things devoted to destruction from your midst. Rise up. Set the people apart as holy. And say, set yourselves apart as holy for tomorrow. For thus Yahweh, the God of Israel, has said, There are things devoted to destruction in your midst, O Israel. You cannot rise before your enemies until you have removed the things devoted to destruction from your midst. In the morning then you shall come near by your tribes, and it will be that the tribe which Yahweh takes by lot shall come near by families, and the family which Yahweh takes shall come near by household, and the household which Yahweh takes shall come near, by, near man by man. And it will be that the one who is taken with the things devoted to destruction shall be burned with fire. He and all that belongs to him because he's trespassed against the covenant of Yahweh and because he's committed a disgraceful thing in Israel. So Joshua arose early in the morning and brought Israel near by tribes and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah near and he took the family of the Zerites and he brought the family of the Zerites near man by man and Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household near, man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to Yahweh, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and declare to me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly I have sinned against Yahweh, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar, and two hundred shekels of sil silver, and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was concealed in the tent with the silver underneath it. And they took them from inside the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the sons of Israel, and they poured them out before Yahweh. Then Joshua and all Israel with them took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? Yahweh will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day, and Yahweh turned from his burning anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the valley of Achor to this day. This is the reading of the Word of God. Uh, just a reminder, brothers, of what's going on here. We're, of course, past what we studied in Numbers, 1400-ish B.C. 
uh, God has been so faithful to his people. Redeeming them from Egypt, he promised to give them the land, which he declared to Abraham many years before in Genesis 12. God is moving them in. They've, they've crossed the Jordan. They are now, uh, God is moving and he is with them to bless his redeemed people to give them all the cities and the land of Canaan, the land of Israel now, which he promised them. Israel had a mission, and Israel's mission in the Old Testament was to be a come and see nation. They were to be a come and see sort of witness. Since the resurrection of Christ and the transition into the new covenant, we are to go, go into the world, go into all the world, to all nations and make disciples. Churches are to be planted and we're to be lights to the nation that way. But in these days, for the most part, Israel was to stay and in light of God's redemption and his grace upon them, they were to be, they were to be a kingdom of priests, a light to the nations. Nations were to come where they were to see. Look at, look at the holiness of these people. Look at the the, the righteousness and the goodness of their laws and their statutes, we need to be like that. And that is part of what is happening here. That you are to be different. You are to trust in God, not gold. You are to trust the Lord, not anything else. It was a critical time to be a witness. They were to drive out the people of the land. We understand there is some significant apparent, I want to say, ethical uh, issues in the book of Joshua as if people, whole people groups are being exterminated. And we have to think rightly about that. This is not a, some genocide at the hands of sinful men. These people, we have to understand, were, were dripping in wickedness, the people that they were driving out. And so this is commanded by God to go do this. This is God's justice. And let God be true and every man a liar. And Mercy was even offered. We see that in Joshua 2 with Rahab. Those who would repent could, be, could integrate into Israel and worship the true God. And so we, we declare that God is righteous. He is the rock. His work is perfect. Deuteronomy 32.4. All his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, upright and righteous is he. And so they're going through the land to purge it of the wickedness. And to do, frank, frankly, to, to do a great service to the world and having a light to the nations and eventually the nation through whom the Savior would come. Deuteronomy 20.18 said that they were to drive out the people so that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done for their gods. So you sin against Yahweh your God. And again, God gave mercy. Israel had just conquered Jericho. An incredible miracle. They had a, they had a ring, a double ring of walls Six feet, six feet thick on the inner and 12 feet on the outer. It was a city on a, kind of up on a hill. And Jer Jericho's destruction was effortless. You know the story. They just walk around and yell and God gives them the victory. And so God promised to bless them. But there was a man who compromised here. And the compromise that happens in Joshua 7 happened way before the taking of the, this wonderful suit from Shinar and the money. This was a failure to start where holiness needs to start in every man, and that's in our heart, in our thoughts, in our motivation, and what we tolerate in the place where nobody can see. Brothers, we are called to be holy men, and that is in our homes and with our wives and in the workplace and in the privacy uh, where no one else can see, the name of the game by the grace of God is holiness. I think it's safe to say that one of the great needs for our wives, and those of you single brothers, don't think this doesn't apply to me because this is a show you're going to get a wife. The great need for our wives is for us to be holy men. The great need for our children is to be holy men. The man submitted to God. So, under our heading, for our headings this morning, we'll see, number one, that our sin can damage God's people around us. As we're striving for holiness, number one, 
as we're striving for holiness, our sin can damage God's people around us. Our sin can damage God's people around us. We are never to think that a tolerated lack of holiness in our lives is just no big deal. You're not spiritual islands. We are connected, first of all, with our families, those who live under our roof, but also in the broader body of Christ. First, our sin can damage those around us. There's no such thing as this is just between me and God. No. When someone cannonballs into the pool, everyone around gets splashed. There's a ripple effect in that pool. You pull one thread in a sweater, all the other threads start to come apart with it. With it. Our sin can damage those around us. Verse 1. Look back there. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully and took some of the things under the ban. The ban, the Hebrew word, it means something devoted. And this is a different kind of devotion. Because God is a holy God. And there must not be anything that has been used for unholy purposes to remain. And so it's devoted It's sacred, but in a different way. Sacred not for the keeping, but for the destroying. Because he's a holy God. And God doesn't need us. And didn't need the Israelites. Well, what are we going to do for supplies? God will make supplies. God will get supplies. Far more important than that is upholding the holiness of God. That the people of God are to guard the holiness of God. How lost that is in our day. And so in purifying the land and being a come and see nation for the glory of God, there needs to be nothing left after, after this victory. Look back at Joshua 6.18 just real quick for a little context. Just turn back one chapter, Joshua 6.18. As for you, he says, only keep yourselves from the things devoted destruction. Lest as you are devoting them to destruction, you also take some of the things devoted to destruction and make the camp of Israel devoted to destruction and bring trouble on it. They had clear commands here. And they had seen God's provision. I mean, he's a pretty competent God. He can, he can provide for us. Because receiving the land wasn't about pilfering and looting. This was about the holiness of God. One man compromises in verse 1 back in Joshua 7. The anger. Therefore the anger of Yahweh burned against the sons of Israel. Oh brothers, God is a, he's a different God than the God that our culture and society would like to fashion, even Christian culture. He's a different God. We're to think of him as the scriptures reveal him because that's who he is. We're not to apologize for these more uncomfortable attributes of God. Like he's some, got like God some inappropriate uncle at the Christmas party who, oh, sorry that he did that. Imagine, imagine your wife and you're introducing your wife to some friends and you start apologizing and oh, there's this one attribute of my wife and yeah, I just, I don't like that about her and what, what a shameful thing that would be. How much more as the people who profess to follow this God who has redeemed them and sent his son for their sins that we would be sorry or apologetic or embarrassed about certain attributes that maybe aren't culturally fashionable at a given time. He's a holy God. And so what happens? Verse 2 to 4, you saw there, they go up to Ai. This town, they've been, God has been blessing their victories Go up, spy it out. Verse 3, Joshua says, you don't, need, you don't need to have the whole entire army, just two or 3,000. God has been so gracious. So they go up, and end of verse 4, they fled from Ai. Something is very wrong. What has happened here? Verse 5, and the men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men, and that might not seem like a lot to us, but none previously were perishing. God says, I am going to bless you and keep you. And they sent them running as far as Shabaram and struck them down in the descent so the people, the hearts of the people melted. 
Ironically, the same phrase in Hebrew word Rahab uses to describe the demeanor of the people of Jericho as they say, we've heard that your God parted the Red Sea and what you did to the Egyptians. It's the same word there, but in reverse. What God brought upon Israel's enemies for Israel's favor has now been brought upon Israel to judge them. Because a man thought that he could play with God. Well, he's a God of grace. He's gracious. He's forgiving. I can compromise in my holiness because of one man's tolerated unholiness. 36 people lose their lives. Families affected. Kids without dads. Wives without husbands. It is a myth to think, well, my lack of holiness is just between me and God. There will be a ripple effect, brothers. You can no more keep the damage and the consequences of your sin to yourself than throwing a boulder in the lake will make no ripple and no splash. And so verse 6. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face. He's mourning. He's, what's going on, God? Lord, he, he's saying in effect and praying in effect, I, I thought you, you, you promised to bless us. What's happening? We're, we're running with our tail between our legs. This is not what you said. Of course, Joshua doesn't have all the data yet. God isn't lying. They were to be holy. One person's sin, one person's sin, notice, cause great, causes great struggle for leadership. Joshua and the elders, the men overseeing things for God's people, they're caring for the needs, they're shepherding God's people, they're preaching the word of God. Something is wrong. They're on their faces, perplexed, carrying a great burden. That's a good lesson for us as well, brothers. That my lack of holiness in my life puts, can put a burden on the men that are called to shepherd me and lead me. It's a great burden. And they're called to carry that burden. Let's be clear. Those of us who are pastors, we're called to. And to never complain and to bless God for it. But it is an added weight to the already existing weight of spiritual leaders when there is a tolerated lack of holiness in the lives of the people. We see that with Joshua here. He is mourning. He's thinking. And it's not a selfish thing. He's thinking about the families. He's thinking about the honor of God being defamed. Notice he said there, what are people going to think? What will you do? Look at the end of verse 9. He says that the Canaanites are going to hear about it what will you do for your great name? This is a concern for the glory of God. And that's the burden that leaders can carry when there's a tolerated lack of holiness in our lives, brothers. It's no different 3,400 years later today. And even in Paul's day. Keep your finger in Joshua 7. Go to, go to Galatians 4 real quick. Galatians chapter 4 in the New Testament. Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Galatians chapter 4, 19. And the situation in Galatia was these people who had professed the gospel were now more mesmerized by the, the Judaizers and believing a false gospel. And look at verse 19. Look at Paul. My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. But I could wish to be present with you now and and to change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. Those of you who have, have children and have seen childbirth in, in the agony your wife went through. And you look at verse 19. My children with whom I'm in labor. That agony. That Paul and the spiritual leaders so love the people. And so are so concerned for the purity of the people and the glory of God. Back to Joshua 7. It's a weight. It's a burden. When a professing believer is in sin, it weighs on the leaders. It's hard not to think about it. It's hard to sleep at night. It's hard to rest and be still. Big idea. Because our sin and our lack of holiness has consequences. But the biggest deal is that it has consequences again in the name of God. Matthew Henry writes here, quote, We cannot urge a better plea than this. Lord, what will you do for your great name? Let God and all be glorified and then welcome his whole will. So the biggest deal here is the disgrace 
of God's honor. Look at verse 10. So Yahweh says to Joshua, rise up. Why is it that you've fallen in your face? Israel sinned. And notice, I mean, it is one guy in this huge nation. He says Israel. Again, you see that connectedness, that ripple effect. And they've also trespassed against my covenant, which I commanded them. They've even taken some of the things devoted to destruction. They've stolen and dealt falsely. Why does he say stolen and dealt falsely? They've broken the commands that I just gave you. Covenant, lying, stealing, and even more, dishonored the name of God. It's a stern correction of Joshua here. Well, he didn't do it, but you see the ripple effect. Again, brothers, we are not spiritual islands. You might, and, and, and a man might separate himself when he's in sin and think, well, I'm just going to cut myself off and no one, can, no one needs a deal. This isn't anyone's business. Oh, it has a great burden and a great ripple effect on the rest of the people of God. Because we are one in Christ, Ephesians 4.3. We have a responsibility to each other to pursue each other's holiness. Your growth, my holiness, is not just important for me. It's important for the, the body of Christ to whom I've connected, to whom I've been connected and into which I've been saved. You know, the, the, the man who thinks that his lack, his tolerated lack of holiness won't damage the rest of the people of God and has no effect. That's like a guy who cuts off his hand and thinks, well, it's just my hand. That's not going to affect the rest of his body. No, that hurts. You've disabled the body. You've caused a great wound. The rest of the body can't do other things now because it has to address this wound. So it is with a man who isolates himself and thinks that a tolerated lack of holiness is okay, acceptable, not, a great, not that big of a deal. These things were under the ban. God specifically commanded, don't touch these things. It's not like Achan didn't know. Verse 12. Therefore the sons of Israel, they can't rise before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies for they become devoted to destruction. I will not. This is, I mean, this is the, the worst possible words to hear. I will not be with you anymore. Unless you destroy the things devoted to destruction from your midst. Verse 13, rise up, set the people apart as holy. And say, set, your, set yourselves apart as holy for tomorrow. For thus Yahweh, the God of Israel, has said, there are, there are things devoted to destruction in your midst, O Israel. You cannot rise before your enemies until you've removed the things devoted to destruction from your midst. It's a picture how our sin hinders us. We can't, just like Israel here, couldn't make progress in God's plan to take the land. We, with a tolerated lack of holiness, we think, well, that's just one area of, of your life. Yeah, it might just be my ankle that's caught in the trap, but the rest of me can't go forward. It cripples the whole body. A tolerated lack of holiness. And it's not that the object themselves is evil. There's no evil or morality in objects. It's that, it's that the objects represent and were associated with the people who are dripping in wickedness and rank idolaters. So God disciplines his people. I'm not going to be with you. You cannot stand. Thankfully, in this side of the covenant, the new covenant, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us. Verse 14 then. So in the morning, then you shall come near by your tribes... And if there's one thing that's not going to be compromised here, it's the holiness of God. That cannot be compromised. And he says, we're going to, we're going to bring the tribes. It'll be the one who's taken, who's trespassed against the covenant. He'll be burned with fire and all that belongs to him. Verse 16, so Joshua arose early in the morning and brought Israel near by tribes. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah near. And he took the family of the Zerites. And he brought the family of the Zerites Man by man, and Zabdi was taken. He brought his household near man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, was taken. God is all-knowing. We cannot fool God. Our thoughts are like a drive-in movie screen before our God. We ever live before him. We say we believe in the omnipresence of God, but we must practice it. The omnipresence of God is not something, just a cold doctrine in a book. It's something to practice. 
when we sin, brothers, we sin in the palm of God's hand. And imagine the scene, the regret, the anger. Those wives without husbands, those children without dads. And this man brought forward some speechless in tears. Some people thinking, man, I, I thought Achan was walking with the Lord. I thought he was in this. I thought he was for God. I thought we were linked arms and, and pursuing the Lord together. What happened? And as it's been said, when a man falls, he doesn't fall far. This, this lack of holiness in his life started a long time before. And so they bring him forward because the holiness of God cannot be compromised. To a decadent audience today, this is troubling, but not to God, who must uphold his holiness. The priority of God's people is to uphold the honor of God. We never have to cater to a wicked culture in our midst to reach them. You, we never have to do that. We realize that, right? Sometimes people talk about, well, I want to be relevant. I want to reach these people. I want to meet them where they're at. Build relationships. It's good to build relationships. But the reason when Jesus, the Son of God, came down from earth, the reason he was so relevant is because he was so holy. The reason he was so effective to reach people is, first of all, because the sovereignty of God and his own holiness. Holiness is relevance. They need to see that we are set apart, the set apartness of God's people. You don't need to like them or make them feel more comfortable to reach them. Whatever can be compromised, it cannot be the holiness of God. And so there is some disturbing in-house business happening here. Verse 19, Joshua says, Achan, my son, I implore you. Give glory to Yahweh. Do you see here that the, the heart of the leaders and the heart of the people, is, it's not just, come on, tell us what you did. It's give glory to God. We need to uphold his glory. Because the church is to be a guardian of God's glory. Whether in 1400 BC in a wicked culture or 2000 in the 21st century AD in a wicked culture. It's his glory we need to uphold. And he's a super competent God. He will use us in the wicked culture to do what he needs to do as we uphold his glory and his holiness. Give praise to him. Declare to me now what you've done. Do not hide it from me. And notice, by the way, confession of sin is giving glory to God. Don't think, well, it's too late. I can't glorify God. If we are in sin, confess it. That gives glory to God. It's to praise him even, a form of praise. It's a peculiar way to say it, but nevertheless, it's the glory of God. I must, we must honor God who we have dishonored. Makes us think today in the church of things like church discipline. Church discipline, when tragically a man persists in sin and step one and step two hasn't listened to, to two or three witnesses and step three, the church must say it. And then step four, we're to treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. And if we're seeing through man-centered glasses and not the Psalm 93 glasses, we can think, oh, that's just unloving. That, that, why, why would you do that? Why, that's, 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 that's shunning. That's No. That's upholding the holiness of God. Well, people will hear about that and they won't want to come to your church. So be it. We're to uphold the honor and the glory of God. And God will save his people. Jesus says to the Father in John 6, of those whom you've given me, I, I, I won't lose any of them. We never have to compromise the holiness of God to reach the lost. Never. God doesn't need us to fudge and say, well, God, you meant well. Let, let me take the white out to some of these commands because you, you need me to be the fourth person of the Trinity to help your mission of reaching the world. We never have to do that. The people of God are to uphold the glory of God. Verse 20. So Achan answers Joshua and says, Truly I've sinned against Yahweh, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. And brothers, no, brothers notice the, the four, the five steps of his spiral here. 
I, verse 21, I saw, I saw the spoil, a beautiful made mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. Then I coveted and took them and behold, they're concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. So um, these were, uh, these, this, this mantle of Shinar, these, this is a, it's like, what, what's that in our day? This is a very prized possession in the ancient world. And a bunch of silver and a bunch of gold, 50 shekels, about 11 pounds, a little more. But notice the diet downward spiral here. First, Achan saw, beginning of verse 21. There's nothing wrong with seeing. That happens. Stuff passes before our eyes. Living in the world, we, we see. You can't help but comes before you at times. But you can help continuing to look. Brothers, let's beware of what we continue to entertain with our eyes or our mind. Sometimes stuff pops in, like, man, where did that come from? You know, like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, he's getting to the end of the valley of the shadow of death, and it says, it says creatures were flying around him, and, and, and he was thinking these vile thoughts. And sometimes he says that Christian, Bunyan writes, Christian was tormented. He couldn't tell if it was his own thoughts or a demon. He just didn't know. And that can be so disturbing, but it's what we do next. You can't help to see in that first moment sometimes. But notice the next step. Here's where, here's where the slippery slope goes. Look at the text. I saw the, the, the mantle, the silver, the gold. Then I coveted. I coveted. What is covetousness? Just, well, I wish I had more. No, 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 no. It, it's like complaining in the relationship with greed. It's a high view of self. If in just a moment, a self-worship, an inflated view of self with a low and accurate view of God that thinks, I deserve, I should have that. I'm so puffed up in myself, thinking of myself more highly than I ought to, violating Romans 12.3, I should have that. It's idolatry of self, not just the thing. Every act of covetousness starts before wanting the thing and an idolatry of self, a self-worship. I coveted. A heart that's... This is Achan's fall here starts when he's discontent way before this and when he's not crucifying his lusts in his heart. When he's not crucifying his self-idolatry, his pride, his high view of self. He's tolerating these little complaining moments in his thoughts that we all are tempted with. And because he wasn't crucifying those and putting those to death, he sets himself up for this moment here. This didn't just happen because he's working on holiness. He, he's, he's compromising his quiet time. He's not in the word of God. He's not spending time with brothers confessing, man, I struggle. Can you pray for me about this? Can you help me? Can you help me, Joshua, and other leaders in the nation to, 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 to put off this pride in my heart while I'm, where I'm seeing a tendency to be discontent? He's getting soft. He's getting lukewarm. He's assuming. So he's covetous already. This is called opportunity in a bad way where ill preparation and providence meet together for a man's downfall. Long before the shine our treasures in the gold, Achan had set himself up for this, tragically. 1 John 2.16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And then the third step, notice, I coveted and took. I took. Every sin of the hands starts with the sin of the heart. I took. By God's mercy, he, he could have, he was sinning in his covetousness, but he could have cut it off right here. What a moment he had to say, oh, my, God said this, and I know my heart has been discontent. My wife's even confronted me on it. Some of the brothers have come. For, he, and, and he would have been okay. He would have been okay. But he didn't. He could have ejected out of his fall at this point. He could have had an escape route out of the slide. 
And he could have said, man, you know what? It's not worth it. This is going to cost me. This is going to cost my family. This is going to cost the, 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 the body of God's people. I know that making this move, it, 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 it would really help my family. It would really help my business. And I could have some more money for my kids, for some inheritance and this and that. But the consequences, I, I just, I have to trust God here. He could have done that. Fourth, so he takes them, and then fourth, behold, look at verse 21, they are concealed. And then it goes to the deceit, right? The cover-up. David, let's put Uriah at the front of the battle. Let's try to cover this thing up. The supposed innocent lie, I'm handling this, okay, I'm in this, I, 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 I'm covering up. And sin is just compounded against sin. Brothers, let's remember that one sin can never be solved by another. When we're in a season and we're lacking in holiness, the solution is not to find an unholy and an unsanctified solution to patch it up. Right? That's like, I'm going to patch up this dam with insufficient materials. I'm going to shove some some cotton balls and a band-aid on this dam that has a leak. No, we have to, we have to stop it up with, with, with concrete, with something of substance. So it is. Our sin is solved not by greater compromise, but repentance. And there's a, a fifth step in the fall, having to get caught. He doesn't confess until, it seems like, well, he confesses it, but he had to be caught. Continuing in the deceit, thinking somehow God won't see. It's buried in there, not caring. Obviously, his, his family had or would see it. Dad, what's that big bump there? Dad, where'd we get all that money? Dad, where'd you get this? Wow, our bank account has just quadrupled. How'd that happen, Dad? We don't want to get to the point where we have to get nailed for our sin. This fall happened a long time ago. And sin damages. Brothers, we just, it, I, it is a battle to, you know, to get up, to read our Bibles sometimes, to pray, to plug in, to, 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 to stay plugged in to all the stuff going on in the church. But we have, this is, it's not a battle of time. We, we want to deceive ourselves sometimes and think, well, I'm too busy. I can't go to this thing. I can't go to the men's thing or spend time in the Word or, or read to my kids. It's not a battle of time. It's a battle of a trust in God. Am I going to trust God that prioritizing holiness actually is, that's going to be the best road. That's going to reap the, 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 the best benefits. This is a trust in God. And this is where Achan buckled. And so second, it's very obvious here. We've got to speed it up here a little bit. But number one, sin damages the people of God. Number two, it damages our family. Number two, our sin damages our family. A disturbing illustration of that here. Our sin damages our family, verse 22 to 25. When we, when we sin, I mean, we, we, we pull our families into it. You say, well, I don't have a family. We pull your, the, your, the family of God into it. But the man, a husband, I'm a leader of my house. And what a sacred, honorable, holy, and weighty thing that is when I take a wife and I take children. I'm the leader of my household. And well, yeah, well, my wife does this and that, this. So what? Praise God you're not in hell. And remember, brothers, there's a sense in which our homes are a reflection of our leadership. Well, the wife does this and that, and the kids do this and that. Well, then, then, then look at yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror. Where are you tolerating a lack of holiness? Our wives, our kids are a reflection of our leadership, for better or for worse. Consequences damage. These consequences, these damaging Effects come into our homes when we tolerate unholiness. Being married 20 years now, this has just become increasingly obvious and convicting to me as the man, so the family goes for the most part. 
if we're not in the word, if we're not in prayer, if we're not staying plugged into the church, that's not going to be a, 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 a consequenceless issue. I need to be in the word. I need to be plugged into the church and staying accountable to men so that I am something of a benefit to my family. It's not a given that just my presence and a paycheck, that that's going to be sufficient to, to carry this awesome stewardship of shepherding my family. We need holiness by the grace of God. And so verse 22, Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent. Behold, it was concealed. The silver, verse 23, they took from them from inside the tent brought them to Joshua, to all the sons of Israel, and they poured them out before Yahweh. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver mantle, gold, sons, daughters. The children have to be pulled into this too. Oxen, donkeys, sheep, tent, everything. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. The Holy Spirit takes the time to record all of this in the scriptures for us, brothers. He owned a lot. I mean, to have, livestock was, was wealth in the ancient world. But it wasn't enough. See that? He had all this livestock, and he still wanted that Shinar mantle, and the silver, and the gold. Do not think that arriving at a certain financial place, status, will settle the issue for it. That is deception. John D. Rockefeller was asked, had a, he had a little bit of success, right? Standard Oil Company. He was asked one time, that John D. Rockefeller at one point, his personal wealth was an actual significant percentage of the United States GDP. And he was asked one time, how much is enough money, Mr. Rockefeller? He said, a little bit more, just a little bit more. It's an issue of the heart. It's an issue of our quiet time. It's an issue of plugging into the church, crucifying, tolerated lack of contentment. Perhaps Achan thought, well, I'm going to use this stuff for good. I'm going to get my family well off. I can just cut a few corners. God understands. I'm in the people of God. I've gone to the festivals. I've participated in worship. I mean, come on, I don't have to be all legalistic and all this obedience. Maybe he thought, yeah, this, this isn't the best idea, but it's going to make my spouse happy right now. Beware of sanctifying sin in the name of us thinking we're going to make our spouse happy. There's no such thing as a sanctified disobedience. Justified disobedience for the sake of presumed future obedience is sin and self-deception. Justified disobedience for the sake of a presumed future obedience is sin and deception, self-deception. I'll disobey you, God, and find a clever way to make it look good. Brothers, God isn't looking for men who are clever. God doesn't need us to be cute and crafty and clever and figure out these grand schemes. Well, I'll do this and and I'll make this plan and bless my family in this way. He just needs holiness. He just wants our obedience. He's simply calling us to submit to him. Why his family though? Why are they thrown in the mix? I think big picture here. The fact that we would have a problem with that is we don't realize how holy God is. The thing that has to be upheld here is the holiness of God. They lived with Achan. It would be hard to hide this elaborate Shinar mantle, this, 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 this gold, this silver. It's not something you could stuff in your pocket. At no point in the text do we see the family saying, Dad, Achan, I, I'm not going to go with you on this. I'm going to go tell Joshua right away. I'm, we're going to this to the leadership, Dad. We can't do this. At no point do you see that happening. I love you, Dad, but I can't participate in this. And if it comes down to it, devotion to God is more important than even to one's family. 
This doesn't mean that, well, my family is being unholy, so forget them, and I'm going to leave them. No, that's sin. If they're not unholy again, that's probably a reflection of us. We're to be there, not participating in their sin, but shepherding it. Perhaps another reason Achan's family is brought into this, sin has consequences that are far-reaching. Sin is learned by watching it. Our sinful nature being drawn naturally towards rebellion. This is one reason why God had to exterminate the Amorites, Hittites, the, the, the Canaanites. Because you'll be tempted. Bad company corrupts good morals, 1 Corinthians 15. And so, verse 25, why have you troubled us? Yahweh will trouble you to this day. Will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones. And they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. The pain, the regret. Brothers, whatever it takes here, whatever it takes in our lives, we have to crucify our sin. Whatever it takes. Chucking out that, gouging out that eye, and Jesus says in Matthew 5. And he doesn't say, well, put it on the nightstand so when you get tempted you can just put it back in. He uses a word in Greek that means just chuck the thing. Like, like from deep in center field to home plate, chuck it as far as you can. Chuck it out of the park. Whatever we do, we pray, God, help me not fall and help me deal with the things that are precursors to a fall. Help me, Father, by your grace. Not to get saved, but because Christ has died for me. This is why we need each other. This is why we need the word of God. This is why we need to be vulnerable with other men of God. Whatever it takes, Lord, I beg you. And men, I, I don't know a lot of you. If any of you here are teetering on the edge of hell and are at the place of Achan, it's not worth it. And God is gracious. And as sin abounds, Romans 5 says, grace abounds all the more. And there are men and leaders here who will walk with you and who have struggled with different things as well. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to drag yourself, to drag the name of God, to drag others into it. James 5.16, confess your sins to one another. You'll be healed. And so they stone him and his whole family and all of their livestock to death and burn it to a crisp. The consequences of sin are so great because the act of sin is so atrocious because the one against whom we sin is so holy. You guys understand this in other terms. We all understand this in other terms. You remember the malice at the palace? The malice at the palace in 2004 between the Detroit Pistons and the Indiana Pacers? Ron Artest, right? Him and uh, I can't remember the other guy they got in a fight. They decked each other. Okay, you know, that happens in basketball. But that fan chucked his drink down, it lands on our test, he gets up and starts brawling with the guys in the stands. You brawl with another NBA player, it's a game or two suspension. He brawled with the guys in the fans, he was suspended the rest of the season, fined millions of dollars. His, 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 his loss was millions of dollars, I should say. And that goes to show us that the one against whom we sin, the, it, it, that, that, that's the, the consequences sort of hinge on that. Right? We sin against a holy God. So there's nothing overboard about this penalty. It's not like any right-thinking Israelite was excited about this. Just like no one is about church discipline, but the holiness of God had to be upheld. And one man's sin damages his whole family. Look, the lesson here is that if you sin, your kids are going to get executed. But there will be consequences, brothers. There will be. And maybe even worse things than them dying. Third and finally, we've got to wrap up here. Number three, God's wrath can be turned from our sin. Finally, number three, God's wrath can be turned from our sin. Verse 25 and 26. God's wrath can be turned from our sin. Verse 
saw in verse 25, the punishment comes. Then verse 26, then they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day when Joshua was written. I mean, even today, to, even in that day, the Valley of Achor, that was just, guys would walk by that and just, just shudder. Oh. And that was to be a motivator. To confess my sin. To deal with my sins at the, at, at, the, at the place of the compromises in thought and with my eyes and not tolerate another look, not tolerate another thought. And to plug in with the men of God and get in the word. And we don't have the valley of Acor today to look at, but we have this passage which is even more valuable. But our, the, the point here is God's wrath can be turned. The, no more wrath was incurred upon the nation because of this event. Verse 26, they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day, and Yahweh turned from his burning anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the valley of Acor to this day. He turned from his anger. And thankfully today, it often it doesn't have to lead to that. You don't have to be executed for looking, for coveting, for concealing. But don't think that the effects are any less severe. I can lead my, my family, my, my, my wife, others astray. But the beauty of this all, brothers, though we, the, the, the sin is turned, God's, excuse me, the wrath of God is turned in a different way. Point being, big picture, backing up, the wrath of God against our coveting and our lack of holiness can be turned. Look, the thing that's most disturbing in the Bible is not why did this guy and his, and his crew have to be stoned and then burned. That's not the most disturbing thing. The most disturbing thing is why is it that the eternal Son of God would come down, get a body, walk in perfect holiness and righteousness, and then have to be nailed on a cross? That's far more disturbing than a sinner being executed. Is the incarnate Son of God being executed in my place for my sin? That's more disturbing And it reminds us that in the grace and the mercy of God, God's wrath can be turned from our sin. Thankfully, it doesn't have to happen in this way. But it happens on the cross. As I bow the knee to Jesus Christ, and I put faith in him by faith alone. There is propitiation for my sin. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. So brothers, let that motivate us to holiness. Father in heaven, we know that those of us who are saved, I, I know, I, Lord, I have galaxies of growth. We have not arrived. And so, Father, we thank you first and foremost that you have turned your wrath away from us and on to your son for our lack of holiness. Oh God, what can we say? What can we say for doing that for us? Wicked men. And so Father, may, we, may none of us leave here without bowing the knee and putting faith in Christ. And then may this motivate us, Father, to greater holiness as men. To cut off the and resist the temptation at the level where they first start in the thoughts, in the heart, and the desires. Father, may that, may that be true of all of us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.